It's a Monday edition of the PFTPM podcast, and we're going to get right to it. It's Hall of Fame head coach, member of NBC's Football Night in America, and one of the most influential voices in all of sports, Tony Dungy, joining me now. Good afternoon, Coach. How's everything? <laughs> hey, I'm doing well, Mike. Good to be with you, even though we have to do it virtually here. It's always good to be with you. Yeah, you know, the thing that I like about this shift to the virtual meetings so many of the interviews we do now are done like this and you can actually see the person instead of doing them by phone it's revolutionized the industry and i think the audience appreciates being able to actually see the person not just hear their voices yeah and i'll tell you what mike i i have you know you have to do what you can do and it's been kind of a blessing to me i've gotten to talk to so many people over the last five weeks uh because you don't have to go somewhere and be there uh, i've spoken to the U.S. Uh, Naval Academy graduates, uh, the USA wrestling team in, in Colorado Springs. And it's just, you know, you have to get used to this format, but it, it's been great. It's been awesome. And the format's been there. It's been available, yeah. but it took something like this for it to explode in utilization to the point where I think it's going to be commonplace whenever we get to the new normal, whatever the new normal may be, one year, two years, three years or longer from now. I feel like this zoom or whatever technology whatever specific platform will be so much more common in the way we communicate and interact than it ever was before i agree with you we've done family uh talks uh with cousins nephews you know grandparents and done it and, and had 12 15 people on things that we would never done before uh so it's something we're getting used to and i think it's going to be great i really do well, the last time we had a conversation like this, Coach, you were on the phone. I was up in my TV studio when we were talking about the, the regression in minority hiring of coaches and general managers, the performance in recent years, which has seen a significant step backward, and your thoughts on what needed to be done to move it forward. And since then, we've seen, at least for what we know so far, a significant proposal that would change that. And my understanding is a lot of things have been happening behind the scenes and I, you've been involved in that. Can you kind of walk us through what's happened since January to get to where we are now? Yeah, uh, the Fritz Pollard Align, uh, uh, the Fritz Pollard Association had kind of aligned with several other people to put together a task force to come up with some ideas that we could present to the diversity committee uh, that, that would help the situation. We went to Indianapolis, we met with the diversity committee, had several kind of conference calls back and forth. Uh, we made some proposals and the diversity committee, I guess has now ready to, on Tuesday, tomorrow, uh, have a, a couple of proposals to be voted on. So uh, a lot of things have taken place. I think the biggest thing, Mike, was the actual broadcast of the draft. I think when people saw that and you saw the decision makers and their families just one after another after another, the draftees and their families, and just that contrast, I think it gave a visual picture to what everyone was seeing. Now, the proposals were reported on Friday, the most significant of which the ability of teams to increase their draft standing in round three by six spots if they hire a minority coach, 10 spots if they hire a minority GM. Those adjustments come the year after the hiring, not in the year of the hiring. There are other incentives tied to allowing coaches to leave for coordinator jobs, quarterback coach jobs elsewhere. And look, there's been a mixed reaction to that. I see both sides of it. I understand that given where the NFL currently is, something needed to happen and something significant needed to happen. Give me your thoughts personally on whether this is the right move, whether it maybe doesn't go far enough or whether it goes too far. Yeah, I, I think that this is definitely something that, that's been looked at and said, hey, we've got to do something drastic. Uh, in my mind, this is drastic. I don't personally think it's the right thing to do, but I think it should spur some uh, really consideration and some communication and conversation and people say, okay, this might not be it, but maybe we can do that. Um, I do like the, the first proposal. I was in favor of it, letting coaches go even out of a contract if they're going to get a promotion. That's going to help the supply part of it. Um, I, I just have never been in favor of 
rewarding people for doing the right thing. And, and so I think there's going to be some unintended consequences. To me, it's almost like the pass interference rule. Yeah, we need to do something. I don't know if this is exactly it. We need to keep working until we find out what that best thing is to do. Hey, Coach, and I agree with you. They've been unable to get people to do the right thing via the Rooney rule. And we see so many occasions where it looks like maybe the spirit of the rule, if not in some cases, the letter of the rule is being violated. We've talked about how teams just use it as a check the box and do what we're going to do anyway. Okay, we've complied with the Rooney rule. Now we can go hire the guy we've wanted to hire all along, the guy we decided six months ago we're going to hire. Um, and there's nothing they can really do about it, so they're flipping it from potentially punitive to potentially uh, rewarding to do something that, as you said, should be the right thing to do and should be done without any type of reward. Um, what – what would you do instead of, of that? Or, or is, there, is there really nothing you can do when it comes to hiring? You just have to create an environment where you hope people do the right thing and encourage them to do the right thing and have neither a punishment nor a reward if they fail to do the right thing. That's where I fall in this. I don't think you can legislate uh, the right thing. I don't think you can legislate fairness. Um, so to me, you have to do other things to kind of try to create that. My suggestion was, if I were the commissioner, I would get every owner to sit down and write out exactly what he's looking for, his qualities that he's looking for in a head coach, a general manager, personnel department, all of those top level positions. Even if I'm not looking right now, spell it out so that when that time does come, I have a blueprint to kind of fall back on. And, and I think that would really help. Number one, it would help owners think about who I have in that position right now. If I'm tempted to make a change and I spell out, here's the five or six things that I really want. And I look at the coach I have now and, and he is that. Well, maybe I don't need to make a change. Maybe that tells me what I'm looking for. But I, I think more than anything, getting owners to really spell it out then you can come and say, okay, if that's what you're looking for, here are some people who fall into that category. Here's people you can look at and uh, we'll have a much better way of going. Right now, it is so, I think so many owners, at least the ones that I talk to, when they're in the process, they really don't know what they're looking for. We talk about the Rooney Rule. I always go back to Dan Rooney in 2006. And he had a lot of qualified people, a lot of good coaches on his staff when Bill Cower retired. He could have hired Dick LeBeau. He could have hired uh, Ken Wisenhunt, Russ Grimm. He had just had Bruce Arians, a lot of people that he knew. But he said, you know what? These guys, that's not my formula. What I've always looked for is young, communicative, defensive coaches uh, that have a future, that have 20 years ahead of them. That's what I'm looking for. And he ended up hiring, finding Mike Tomlin. But the easy way would have just been to say, I don't really know what I'm looking for. I've got good people here. Let me just hire Russ Grimm because we've won and he's great. Or, or let me hire Ken Wisenhunt. He worked with the quarterbacks and he's great. Uh, but Dan said, no, I, I have a way of doing this and it worked out pretty well. And I, I think that's the kind of thinking that we've got to stimulate. And, you know, it's funny. I think part of it also comes from the pride that owners naturally have and it's human nature when you're not quite sure what to do, but you don't want to ask for help. You don't want to expose to anyone on the outside, I really don't know what to do here. And we see the NFL connect teams with search firms all the time when they're looking for someone. I, I think what you're saying suggests maybe that whole process begins one step back. When you first start thinking about maybe making a change, that's when you get someone from the outside to help you identify what you're looking for, identify the factors. Because as you said, there's a chance that the end result may be, I'm fine with the guy I have. I'm not going to make a change at this time. And if you do make a change, you're going to be doing it from the standpoint of what you're looking for by way of qualities, not, hey, this guy's available. He won a Super Bowl. I need to go get him. Yeah, I'll tell you a story relating to my own experience uh, about that whole thing. And, and it's the process of picking people. Um, Jeff Lurie, when he bought the Philadelphia Eagles, he was making a change in the mid-90s, hiring head coaches. He interviewed me. 
And I remember asking him, what are you looking for? That was my last question. What do you want in a head coach? And we talked about it. And he said a few things that he was looking for. And I told my wife, I think I'm going to get this job because what he described is me. And everything that he said he wanted, I, I think I can deliver. Why well, didn't get the job? He ended up hiring Ray Rose, another African-American coach. It wasn't anything racial. It wasn't this. He hired Ray Rose, and uh, it lasted a few years. But Ray was not what he described to me. Then he hired Andy Reed. And I remember telling my wife, and I told Jeff Lurie at the owner's meeting, now you've hired the exact person you described. You, the things that you said you want, you hired him. They had a long and successful run. Well, then he let Andy go, and he hired Chip Kelly. My son played for Chip Kelly. Chip Kelly is brilliant. He's smart. He was a great offensive innovator. He was not what Jeff Lurie was describing. So I'm thinking, well, maybe he's changed his mind on what he wants. It didn't work out. Didn't last long. Then he hired Doug Peterson, who is exactly what he described to me 25 years ago that he wanted. And it, it just really reinforced to me, if owners know what they want and they are diligent in finding that person, then it'll work and, and you'll have better outcomes. And one of the realities in the NFL with 32 different teams, 32 different operations, there's a reason why teams are changing coaches and general managers on a regular basis. Sometimes there is just some form of dysfunction embedded in the organization that prevents it from doing what it needs to do, from identifying the factors that need to be identified, and then from acting on the right factors if they happen to put together a list of what they are looking for. Yeah. And, you know, you talk about the search firms and, and, you know, how some teams are using those. Again, it's the same thing. You have to describe what you're looking for. I, I had another interview early on in my career. I was still an assistant coach, uh, interviewed with a team, and we got to the end of it, and the owner said he was looking for somebody to run everything, to kind of be the Bill Parcells, the head coach, general manager, president, was all going to be wrapped up in one. That wasn't me. All I wanted to do was coach. I didn't feel like I was qualified to do that. I didn't want to be a GM, so that job wasn't for me. Some search firm could have said, hey, Tony Dungy's the best candidate out there, and he's great, and he's this and that. But for that particular owner, I wasn't the best candidate because I didn't want to do that. So, again, it, to me, it comes down to what are you looking for and then find the best person to do that. And one of the other problems with the proposal, and we'll talk more in a minute about where that proposal may be headed, the idea that the reward for a team that makes a minority hire, whether a coach or a GM, is to move up in the draft. Well, as you move somebody up, you move somebody else down, and it does work to the detriment of the teams that maybe already have a minority coach or minority GM or both, or teams that are stable and aren't firing their coaches or their GMs on a regular basis. So that's one of the things that I think may be rubbing people the wrong way. There's an inherent detriment to everyone else if you take one team and say, we're going to boost you up the ladder. Well, not only that, Mike, I've talked to several uh, African-American coaches in, in the league right now to get their response. And here's, there, there's three things that they're worried about. Number one, how does this put me in my relationship with the other coaches that I work with? And, and other white coaches? Are they thinking I'm getting an advantage now? Number two, when that general manager or owner hires me, is he hiring me because he thinks I'm the best person or is he hiring me to move his draft choice up a little bit? Uh, and then the third thing is nobody feels like they want anything special or an advantage. Don't hire me and then say, I'm going to give you more draft choices later on because you need help. Or, you know, and I know that's not the reason why the, the proposal is being put in. I know that's not, you know, what they're driving at, but that's still the end result. And, and so uh, there, there's some things I think the league needs to think about, about this proposal. Yeah, I spoke at length yesterday with Cyrus Mary, the co-founder of the Fritz Pollard Alliance, and he describes it as a diversity boost and that other companies use something like it. Usually it's in the form coach of bonuses for senior management based upon diversity performance. And that's fine because it's different from that inherently competitive 
32 teams, everyone wanting to draft as high as possible and get the best possible picks, and you are moving some down, moving some up. And also, and you're touching on one of the concerns that Lewis Riddick shared with Peter King in Football Morning in America, the idea that as you walk through the door, people may be viewing you differently. You are undermined before you even start the job because there's this sense that some may have that the only reason you're getting the job is because the team derives some tangible benefit from hiring a minority GM or coach. Yeah, and there, there is. I, I think the league is looking and saying, hey, punitive things haven't worked. Let's look at incentives. And maybe that's the right way to go, but I, I don't know if this is the right incentive. So this is going to be voted on tomorrow. And the people that I've talked to kind of have a sense this is going to get passed, that it just, it's something that the commissioner wants. It's something that enough of the powerful owners want. And I don't sense a coordinated pushback to stop it from happening. But if you had a vote, it sounds like your vote would be no, which I think should speak volumes to anyone out there who has a vote on Tuesday on this proposal. I, when I looked at it, I didn't see how it would pass. A lot of people are telling me that it will. I think if it does pass, it'll end up being like the pass interference uh, review rule. We'll see in, in a little while some, some unintended consequences that will say, gosh, this, this might not be the best idea. Now, my understanding also, Coach, is that this proposal that's come to light is part of what could be a broader overhaul of the hiring process, that it's going to be more comprehensive, that, you know, Peter King has advocated for a shifting of when you actually can even begin to hire coaches. Do you get the sense that there may be something else coming down the pipeline that would be even more broad and more comprehensive than what they've already proposed? Well, this task force, we did present a lot of ideas and a lot of ways to make the hiring process better. One of those was delaying the, the process, letting everybody get through the playoffs, uh, slowing things down. That was Dan Rooney's whole idea about the Rooney rule, not the fact that you're interviewing minority candidates necessarily, but slow the process down. Take, take your time doing it. And I, I, I think that's something that needs to be done. And uh, we have you know, made a lot of proposals. I don't know what will happen with this. Obviously, the, the way it has gone in these last seven, eight years uh, has not really helped the league in terms of diversity hiring. Well, the intent seems to be in a good place. And I feel like that the attention of the right people has been secured. The question now is, how do you take that, that desire to encourage teams to do the right thing and craft it into something that is practical, that is proper, and that gets you to the right place the right way? Like Anthony Lynn said, the Chargers head coach, sometimes you do the wrong thing trying to do the right thing. The goal is they want to do the right thing, and let's hope they get nudged toward the right path. And it sounds like there's hope that that'll happen, but this proposal would at least in the short term not be the right path. You know, and, and that's uh, when, when I was coaching, we'd, you'd have these owners meetings, the head coaches would be there, the GMs, everybody would be together. You'd get these proposals, you'd talk about them. The owner has a chance to talk with his head coach, with his GM, and hash it out, and then they'd go back and vote. Well, now, uh, apparently, that's not going to be the case. It's a, a virtual meeting, Zoom meeting with just the owners. So I, I don't know. I, I think it would be better to get conversation about this uh, before they vote on it. Hopefully, uh, these owners have done that and had some conversations with their coaches uh, before tomorrow. But I think you're right. Whether it's what they're going to do as a replacement for pass interference for replay review, which is going to be tough to hash out, through a Zoom connection, or these deeper issues about how to best handle and best address this legitimate and genuine desire to improve the minority hiring practices. Look, the hiring cycle doesn't start next week. That's one of the things that's kind of confusing to me. Maybe that can be tabled until a time when everyone can get together, when there can be face-to-face -face discussions and, and there's just something organic about having everyone in the same room or all of the owners present and hashing it out that way than doing it remotely, especially as more and more pictures pop up on your computer screen, you, get lo you lose track of who all's involved and who isn't. Yeah. So may maybe the, the smart thing to do is, is to have the conversation tomorrow, table it for now, 
until a time when they can all get in the same room and really figure out what they want to do. Coach, I know you're busy. Okay. A couple of other things real quickly before I let you go. There was a rash of arrests over the weekend. Two of them arose from incidents last week, then two other incidents that happened. And one of the reasons it stands out is players have done, I think, a very good job in recent years of staying out of trouble away from the field. I think one of the realities this year, with no off-season program, no opportunity to have development meetings, to reinforce messages from coaches, guys are left for their own devices. I, I, I feel like maybe some players, and again, it's not many in the grand scheme of things, but some players may be losing their way because there isn't that chance for the coaching staff and other members of the organization to constantly remind them of what they need to do to stay on the right side of what the law requires. No, no question about it. Uh, not having those group meetings, not having the team uh, be involved, and then not having even really the involvement of their teammates and their peer group. So it's too bad that you see these incidents, but you almost could figure something was coming just with so many players kind of on their own at this point. And I think one of the realities is as the teams have more meetings this week, moving up the agenda beyond learning the playbook is going to be, let's make sure that we're dealing with these guys the right way so they understand how to make good choices when they don't have that influence of their teammates right there, when they don't have the coaches there hammering it in. And not that it needs to be every single day, but you know, guys are young, early 20s, sometime with temptation, with downtime, things can happen. And uh, it doesn't happen very often anymore, which I think is very good. But this little flare up that we've seen in recent days hopefully provides teams with an incentive yeah. to get things moving in the right direction. Love Coach, it. I thank you very much for your time today. <laughs> it's great seeing you. It's great talking to you. Very informative, very insightful views on the efforts to enhance the Rooney Rule and expand and promote minority hiring. We wish you all the best and I can't wait to see you in person, hopefully sooner rather than later. Hey, thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. Always good to be with you. Hi, I'm Mike Tirico, and thanks for watching. Make sure to hit subscribe for the latest news and highlights from NBC Sports.